Who did he call when everybody was mad at him? Who did he call when all the people left him? Who did he call? Heaven. Didn't even need a cell phone for that. Didn't need to dial the number. Prayer is where you need to go first. You should immediately go to prayer. Immediately spend your heart and mind before the Lord. That's what you should do. And that's how you get the guidance of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to read again the, um, the, the verse in 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Peter tells us, we talked about this last week, Peter tells us that our goal is to follow in the steps of Christ. That's what we should do. Not just be care, just be concerned about what he's concerned about, but we literally are supposed to walk in his steps in the ways that he wants us, in the way he showed us how to walk. He showed us how to live our lives by letting the Spirit of God fill us and guide us. So this message this morning is entitled, The Steps of Spirit Control. Last week we talked about the steps of servanthood, and this week we're going to talk about spirit control. I'm going to tell you something. This is the key to walking the Christian life, and I trust, I trust that you'll understand it and, and make some decisions today. We're going to start with Luke chapter 4. We're going to go to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And uh, Jesus is standing here. This is an interesting story. Um, he is brought into Nazareth. And it says in verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So his custom, every Sabbath day, he would show up in the synagogue and his custom was to read the scriptures, to read aloud the word of God. And there was delivered unto him the book of the, the, book of the prophet Isaiah. That's uh, in, in the, in the, uh, the, the Greek um, uh, transliteration of Isaiah. Isaiah is what it is. But it was the book of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So if you can, uh, if you can uh, picture this for, for just a minute. The book he read was not like a book like this. It was actually a scroll. And so he picked up, they gave him this scroll, and he unrolled the scroll, and he's looking for something specific. He wants to say something particular, and he's scrolling through it. He doesn't have columns and numbers and chapters like we do. He's just got this big scroll, and he's looking about three-quarters of the way. We get to um, Isaiah 61, and that is where he went. Here's what he says in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. One of the reasons it caught everyone's attention. Sometimes, you know, you know, I've noticed this over the years. We have what we call eight second intervals. And while I've been talking about eight, every eight seconds, your mind has gone to something else. Your mind's over here, over here. If I said French fries, bacon, any one of those things, your brain would be, doo -doo -doo -doo, but what am I going to eat for lunch today? Some of you are already there. Is the crock pot still on? Is the oven, is the roast burning? Probably, yes. But anyway, uh, your mind is going, oh, what are we going to do tomorrow? And while I'm reading the scriptures, oftentimes your brain goes into that thing. Well, that's not unusual. It's common. And that's what Jesus, as his custom was, to stand up and read. And he's reading in the book of Isaiah. And everybody's like, this is going to be another day, Jesus reading the Bible. And all of a sudden, he, in the middle of the sentence, stops. And if you go back to Isaiah 61, you'll see the rest of the verse is about vengeance. He left that part off. He stopped in the middle of the verse. And he said, this is the acceptable day of our Lord. And, and the Bible says every eye was a fastened on him because all of a the sudden, they're like, wait, 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 wait. That wasn't what I was expecting. Something different. Sometimes you'll see that in our church services on Sunday morning, like this morning. Something different. 
The reason why we do things different sometimes is to shake everybody up because you get into your eight-second intervals and you're like, oh, this is what's going to come next and this is what's going to come next. And, then, and we want everybody to stop for a minute and think about what's going on. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus did. He just, wait. And you're like, whoa, what's this about? I want you to see what he's focusing on. He's focusing on the Spirit of the Lord being on him. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to do these things. I'm to preach to the poor. I'm to fix the brokenness. I'm to break the yoke. That's what the Bible tells us in Isaiah 61. You could go back and read about that. Listen, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Preach to the poor. Give them hope. Heal the brokenhearted. Right? What's it say? What's it say? Go, go back to verse 19 again, or 18, is it? Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is by me to preach the gospel of the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to captives, recovering sight of the, to the blind, to set at liberty them that are, that, are, that are bruised. That's what he said he was about. That's what he was supposed to do. That was, he was laying out a path for himself. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to go back, if you would, to John chapter 3. I want you to see this. John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God hath sent, John the Baptist speaking, he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. In other words, he's saying he completely unlimited. God didn't say, okay, you got a little bit of the Spirit, and you got a little bit of the Spirit, and you got a little bit of the Spirit. He said, when you speak the words of God, God doesn't pour out his spirit in limited portions. He pours it on at unlimited measure. That's what it says. Make sense? Now stay with me here. He's talking specifically about Jesus Christ. Folks, I've noticed something. I've noticed something if I read the life of Christ. I've noticed that everything he did in this life was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you agree with that? I mean, when he walked on the water, it was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. When he healed the sick, when, it, didn't he, when he rebuked the demons, didn't he do that by the power of the Holy Spirit? He did, right? And he did that in such a way that we're supposed to follow in that path. Look what he says in John 15. Stay with me here. John 15, verse 26. John 15, verse 26. Jesus is telling his disciples, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit, capitals S, Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Jesus said, I'm going to send the comforter to you. I'm going to send the Spirit of God to you. Stay with me here. Acts chapter 1. After Jesus is resurrected from the de dead, the Bible says in verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days as speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait. He said, for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. What was that promise? That the Comforter was going to come, right? The Holy Spirit, right? For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt not thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? He said unto them, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but... Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. What's the power of the Holy Spirit going to do? It's going to make you a witness of God. Right? It's going to testify of God. That's what it says. So he said, the comforter is going to come. I'm going to send him to you. And he said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until that power comes on you. I said, boy, I wish I had that power on me. Go back with me to Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> I 
verse 9. Luke 11, verse 9. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give what? Give what? Give what? Say it again. Give what? Unto them that ask him. You see, Jesus did everything he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what he said to us? He said, I'll give him to you too if you ask for him. But you got to ask for him. You got to want him in your life. You got to want him there. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He said, marvel not, unto thee, uh, uh, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Everyone in this room, listen to me, you have to be born again of the spirit of God. That spirit of God, you have to ask God for that spirit of God. And when you ask him, he will come on you in a powerful way. I've seen this happen over and over again. I've seen a Christian uh, or, or a lost person come to Christ and immediately there is a brightness and a joy about them. There is a burden rolled off of their shoulders like they've never experienced before. The Holy Spirit just sweeps in and takes over and gives them new direction in their life like they've never seen before. How many of you could testify to that fact? You've asked him and what has he done? He's given you exactly what you asked for. But what you need to understand is that Holy Spirit that he gave to you is the exact same Holy Spirit that he had. And that's how he walked through that Christian life. How he walked through that life and the life that you're supposed to walk, that's how you walk it, with that same power. Are you following me? Okay. So, the filling of the Spirit is how he walked. You want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus? How should you walk? With the Spirit of God, full of the Spirit of God. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1 that when we believed, uh, let me read it to you. Galatians, Ephesians, here it is, chapter 1. Uh, in whom ye also trusted, verse 13, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and of the praise of his glory. I want, I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you're 8 years old, you're 9 years old, you're 12 years old, you're 15 years old, you're 120 years old, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you ask him, the Holy Spirit of God will come into you and fill you. It will happen. It'll happen like this. Are you with me here today? Stay awake. So I don't have to do cartwheels on the top of the the backs of the chairs, that might get dangerous. It's important, isn't it? Filling of the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit filling you right now? If you've asked him to fill you, fill you. if you've asked for God's Holy Spirit in your life, he will give it to you. You have it. Secondly, In John 14, verse 16, look what it says here. I'll give you several scripture verses today. John 14, verse 16, Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither Knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Verse 26, same chapter. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. 
Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What's he telling us here? He's telling us that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, will come and he will teach you all things. He will guide you and, and direct you. How many of you have ever noticed the Holy Spirit guiding you? Hmm? Look what it says in chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Listen, he's going to guide you. He's going to direct you. Watch this, stay with me. In James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Pay attention. Let the eyes of everyone be upon the word of God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What's he saying here? He's saying the Holy Spirit of God is there. He's there for the asking. But there will come times in your life, have you guys ever noticed have there ever been times in your life where you've wondered what you were supposed to do next? How are you supposed to proceed? What you were supposed to, how you were supposed to respond to something? Anybody ever had that problem? What does the Bible say here? Ask God. If you don't have wisdom, the Holy Spirit of God that's in you has the wisdom to guide you. You understand what we're talking about here? We're talking about God, the creator of the universe that knows how everything works and knows the end from the beginning, knows what's going to happen next. That God is the God that's going to speak to you and guide you and show you what your next step is. That's when you are <coughs> guided by the Holy Spirit. How do you get guided by the Holy Spirit? Matthew chapter 6. Listen to the words of God. As we read them, Matthew chapter six, verse six says, but when thou prayest, well, let's go to verse five. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. A lot of people <clears throat> want that. They want to be noticed for their humility, noticed for their spirituality, noticed for their, what they know. They want, to be, they want to be noticed. And he says, don't do that. He said, verse 6, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. How will he reward you? He'll reward you by showing that you have wisdom that he's given you. How to sort through that? Well, these guys, I respect all them. They have wisdom. But this guy says, do this. This guy says, do this. And this guy says, do this. Which one is right? Well, that didn't help. <laughs> we were raising our children. I wanted so desperately to raise kids that would serve God. I wanted my kids to serve God. I saw so many pastors lose their children. I saw so many families. They would have kids that just went to the world and did things that were just horrible, wrecked their lives, drugs, drinking, all that kind of stuff. I didn't want my kids to do that. Like, how do I raise them? And I remember every pastor that would come through my wife and I'd sit in there. We would talk about when the kids were little. We'd talk about, okay, how do you raise your children right? What do you do? What do you do? And I remember one time my wife saying to me, we got to stop listening to what everybody's saying because this guy says this, this guy says this, this guy says this, all different things. And that's when I sat down and took the Bible and I said, what does the Bible say about child rearing? One of these days, I'm going to give you a series on that to show you what I found. But there's over 2,800 verses in the Bible about raising kids, about children. 2,800. Don't tell me there's no manual. You just haven't read it. It's in there. 2,800. I compiled it together and found out a whole bunch of things about raising kids. And that was the path. That's where we started. 
working. Once about that time, we said, okay, this is what we're going to follow the Bible. What the Bible says here, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. This is what the Bible says. We're gonna, that's why we're going to raise our kids. I'll tell you what, listening to everybody's voices is confusing, isn't it? You ever been there? Sometimes you can call people, and that's what our first response is. Usually we don't want an answer. I've had people call me and say, Pastor, I need some counsel. And when I tell them something, well, I don't want to do blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you didn't call for counsel. You called for permission. You got to figure out what you want to do. First thing we want to do is call somebody, commiserate, and tell them how bad we are or how bad we feel or how bad we've been treated or whatever. What should you do first? They that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Jesus is telling us over and over again, what? I wonder who he called. Who did he call when everybody was mad at him? Who did he call when all the people left him? Who did he call? Heaven. Didn't even need a cell phone for that. Didn't need to dial the number. Prayer is where you need to go first. You should immediately go to prayer. Immediately spend your heart and mind before the Lord. That's what you should do. And that's how you get the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you time and time again, when I've said to God, I don't know what to do, and I literally did not know what to do, and immediately a Bible verse that guided me would come in my mind and heart. How many has that ever happened to? Huh? Immediately that verse will pop in mind and say, oh, I got to do that. Right? If you've not done that as a Christian, then you're not following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Jesus would go oftentimes. He said, well, he is God. Yes, but he... We're walking in his steps. His steps show us how to live the Christian life. And the way he did it was he always went to prayer. Always. Hello, the God of the universe is the only one that can fix it all. Is that not right? He knows what's going to happen. He knows the end from the beginning. Right? Do this. It'll help you. All right. And now, let's talk about why Christians don't do things right all the time. Because if the Holy Spirit is in us, hello, and we're praying and asking Him, hello, how come we don't always have the right outcomes? In Luke chapter 9, the disciples come to Jesus in verse 49. John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followed not with us. He said, yeah, he wasn't in our church, not part of our denomination. He didn't use the same Bible we used. Uh, we told him, though. We told him, Lord. We straightened him out. He was not one of us. And it came to pass, verse 50, Jesus said to him, forbid him not. For he that is not against us is for us. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. So he goes to this village. Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, is going to this village. Listen to me now. Listen to me. Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, has gone to this village, listening to the Holy Spirit, praying, asking the steps that he should take, he goes to this village and whoops, they did not receive him. Just because he was following the Holy Spirit does not mean that everyone that you talk to is going to listen to what you have to say. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. 
And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Ha ha. Oh, we're going to burn him, God. We're going to burn him. He's not doing right. He turned and rebuked them and said, look at this. You know not what spirit, what manner of spirit you are. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Do you know what I've noticed? Believers can have a wrong spirit. Uh, good people. The Bible tells us in Acts that devout women and chief men of the city were stirred up by the devil. Do you know the devil can can you can get up? He you can give him a place in your life, a good person that loves God. What? Turn to Mark if you would. Mark chapter fourteen. I've seen this happen more often than not. You need to check and see, measure yourself and see if you're right. Jesus is saying to the disciples, or to the disciples as they, as they're, um, as they're um, waiting for the crucifixion. He says in verse thirty-eight, "Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation." Look at this: the spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Do you know we can limit the Holy Spirit? We can give the devil a place in our lives. Go with me to Ephesians 4. I'm going to wrap this up real quickly. But I want you to, I want you to stay with me because I'm going to ask you to do something here in a minute. Ephesians chapter 4. Here's what it says in verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Who's he talking to? Christians. Do you know a Christian can give the devil a place in your life even though you've got the Holy Spirit? I'm not, I don't believe a Christian can be demon-possessed because I don't believe, I don't believe that, um, I mean, if the Holy Spirit possesses you, you're his. If he bought you with a price, what? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? And you're bought with a price? Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. It's not a temple of the devil. You can't be demon-possessed, but you can be demon-influenced if you give him a place. You can let the devil have a place in your life when you allow bitterness in your life. Look at chapter 5 of Ephesians. Verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I've had people leave our church over, over me preaching about this. I'm going to tell you something, Christians. When you give yourself over to mind-altering drugs, whether it's, whether it's alcohol or marijuana or, or um, uh, prescription medica medicines, and you allow those things to be your downers, to rest, make you, well, I got to have this, to rest. You use that stuff, you cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit. There's another spirit guiding you. There's another spirit filling you. He says here, be not drunk. I know we can debate all day about being drunk with the Spirit, being drunk with, with whether we're drunk or not drunk. With Everyone that drinks alcohol, almost everyone says, I can handle it. None of them uh, usually admit to being drunks. I'm going to tell you something. Alcohol is a problem. Alcohol causes problems. Marijuana causes problems. So, does it, so do prescription drugs. Any substance that takes control of the Holy, out of the Holy Spirit's hands in your life, any substance that you use is wrong. A Christian should allow the Holy Spirit to fill their lives and they should never give the devil a place. Are you hearing me? I'm going to tell you something. When you quit that garbage, you'll find out how clear your brain is. Foggy mountain breakdowns, not just a song. That's the way some of your brains are. 
adult. Our job is to bring the Spirit of God to this world. And we are getting overcharged with things in this life. We're letting ourselves enjoy, and Christians that have gotten away from it and have fallen back into it have found out that their brains and minds are so foggy. And some of you, if you came this morning in that way, you don't even realize it. You don't even realize how much fog has rolled in in your head. I'm going to tell you, good people get wrapped up in this. Good people, Christians that have the Holy Spirit of God in them, get wrapped up in this. And they allow things in their life they should not allow. And they've limited the Spirit of God. The Bible says, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And you have no idea the damage you're causing to the people that are around you. Listen to me, Christians. You don't even know the brokenness that you're causing. You don't even know the tragedies that are happening right around. The ones you're supposed to be protecting, whose lives are breaking up, whose lives are falling apart, because you're not bringing the Holy Spirit to the game. You're wrapped up in yourself. You've quenched him. You've given the devil a space in your life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 18 says this, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Here's a, here's a verse to remember. Verse 4, or, 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 there's four words in this verse. Verse 19, quench not the Spirit. Can you say that aloud with me? Say it with me, class. Quench not the Spirit. Say it aloud. Quench not the Spirit. Say it louder. Quench not the Spirit. He's talking about uh, this fire burning inside of you. He's talking about don't put out that fire. Don't put it out. It's in there, it's burning, it's doing something, and you put it out. That's why you can be going hot for God one day, and all of a sudden you're, what am I doing way over here? Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you Holy, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Your whole body. See, here's what's going on in our lives, Christians. What you're doing, what you're doing is, and some of you are saying, well, he's, he saw what I did Friday night. I have no idea where you were Friday night. I don't know what you were doing Friday night. I don't know what you were doing last night. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not pointing at any one person in here because I'll bet you this was a shotgun blast and hit a bunch of people in here and didn't just hit one. You feel like crawling under the seat right now because you're afraid I saw something? I did not. I'm telling you, God is my witness. I'm telling you this. If you're allowing things in your life, little things that are destroying you, it's taking away little bits by little bits by little bits of your life. You're allowing those things in your life to take over your mind, take over your heart, take over your life. Little by little by little, you've allowed the devil more and more space. And so the Spirit of God has not been able to guide you. He's not been able to lead you. He's not been able to speak to you. He's not been able to speak through you. And you wonder why you're not reaching people for Christ. You wonder why lives are not being changed it's because you yourself are a servant of corruption to whom a man is a slave to he's a servant to someone who something is oh, overcome the i says to whom us uh one who's overcome if you're overcome it's in peter i can't remember let me let me read that verse um i need to quote that verse to you is it um Second Peter 2.19, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. If something overcomes you, you're in bondage to it. You're a slave to someone and something besides Jesus Christ. Hello. Quenching the Spirit of God. Quenching the Spirit of God. Listen to me now as I wrap this up. I want to ask you a question. What spirit are you of? 1 John 4, 1 says, try the spirits. Try them and see if they be of God. 
In Galatians chapter 5, I, I, I want you to read this with me. I want you to see what this, as, as, we, as we wrap up the service tonight, today, I want, you to, I want you to read that. I want you to see what he's saying here. Verse 16 of Galatians 5. This I say then. Now, now get your, look, we're winding this up. Get back in here. Take your eight, eight second interval. Saddle it up. Grab the reins. Sit back. Here we are. Come back here. Focus. Listen to what the Bible says. This I say then. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. These things are immorality. If you're struggling with immorality in your life, you're not being led by the spirit. Do this, it'll help you. If you're struggling with immorality in your life, adultery, fornication, any kind of uncleanness, lasciviousness means you have no boundaries. Lasciviousness is you do whatever, there's no law, you do whatever, whatever you want to do. There's no boundaries. Whatever your flesh wants. Verse 20, idolatry and witchcraft. These things have to do with spirituality. Listen to me, Christians. It amazes me when I hear Christians talking about the zodiac or the horoscope. You should have nothing to do with any of that. Any kind of idolatry, any form of idolatry, in any way, shape, or form, you should run from it. Anything that lifts up something besides Jesus Christ, you should run from it. Hello. So I don't involve it. I don't get involved in idolatry or witchcraft. You don't do that at Halloween either. You don't, you, don't get, get, you don't avoid witchcraft at Halloween? Oh, the churches are doing trunk or treat. What? Trunk or treat? What? Why does a Christian have anything to do with a day that honors witches? Hello? Witches and black magic? What? Well, let's go down to Comic-Con, down at, down, at down at the mall. Oh, there's Ouija boards and all kinds of fun little gadgets and gidgets that the, the witches are doing, and we don't have to worry about it. It's okay. It's all fine. No, it's not. A Christian should run away from that stuff. Hello? If you're doing it, you're not led by the Spirit. You're led by the flesh. Can a Christian be led by the flesh? Mm -hmm. Do Christians do those kind of things? Yes, they do. Is it right? No, it is not. Drunkenness. Oh, wait, wait. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, stra strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. This is social problems. If you're involved in hatred, or wrath, or seditions, or heresies, seditions, what is seditions? Do you know seditions are, are um, what's the word? Um, what do we call them today? We call them conspiracies. Blows my mind when I walk into church. I'm not talking about this church, but I walk into a church and there's these conspiracy clubs in the church. You know, people want to talk about, you know, this listen, you know, well, you saw the World Trade Center. Well, Bush did that. You know, he did blah, 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 blah. How do you even know? Well, I know because I watch TikTok. God bless you. Sounds like a malady. Christians, you need to stay away from seditions and heresies. Stay away from conspiracy theories. Stop worrying about it. 
Why are you fretting about it? Hey, this place is going to burn up. It's going to be over with, and Jesus is going to be the king. We should watch about, we should watch about end time things. We should watch because he tells us to watch. But stop freaking out about it. If the Antichrist gets elected in November, boy, howdy, we're out of here. Why are we freaking out? Why are we scared about it? That's the flesh, my friends. Envyings, murders, envying. Envying over position and power. What? Look at this. Drunkenness and revelings. That's talking about addictions. So we're talking about immorality. We're talking about spirituality. We're talking about social uh, uh, problems. We're talking about addictions. And such like, he says, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they which do this thing shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking about the things in this life and this world. You're not going to inherit the peace of God. You're not going to inherit what goes on here. And possibly that world, the people that do those things, and that's their life, they're not saved. It's really bad when Christians, when the light that is in you is darkness. It's really bad. Now look at this. But the fruit of the Spirit, you ready for this? Is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If ye live in the Spirit, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another, looking for glory, looking for position. Don't do that. That's, not, that's the flesh. That's not the Spirit. What's the spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance is self-control. Ask yourself what spirit you're of. What is your spirit? Are you loving? Are you joyful? Do you have peace in your heart? Are you long-suffering with folks who fall? Are you gentle with everyone? Do you have goodness? Are you, are you trying to be good? Are you involved in goodness? Are you, are you believing God? Are you trusting him? Do you have meekness in your life? That's, that's a lack of self-defense. Temperance, do you have self-control? Measure the spirit. By this, I'm going to tell you, I've seen, I know people, I know people that say they're Christians and nothing in their spirit reflects what I just read. There's no love, there's no gentleness, there's no long suffering, there's no self control. The Spirit of God is nowhere around them. Are they saved? Could be. But if they're saved, they quench the Spirit. Quenched them. He's put out in their life. They're back following the flesh. Some of you guys are doing that. Oh, don't think about somebody that's not in this, in this auditorium. There are people watching online. God bless you. Don't think about someone else. It's time to look inside. Is the Spirit of God driving you? Is the Spirit of God filling you? If you want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, you need to walk in such a way that you are Spirit-controlled. Everything you're engaged in, everything you're involved in, the Spirit of God should be around.